Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 32nd International Congress on Pediatrics. In today's webinar agenda, we will be covering immunology and allergy session. We invite physicians around the world to join us and share their valuable experience with us. This is the third day of our online webinar, and we are happy we were able to perform it in a timely manner. I hope you haven't missed those two days, and if so, don't worry, because you have access to recorded session on our website. I am Dr. Dr. Azim Qamari, medical doctor from Tehran University of Medical Science, the manager of the, this webinar. Uh, we are so happy to have Professor Nimarizai with us. Uh, uh, I want, I, uh, I'd like to introduce today's panelists. We are so happy to have uh, Professor Nimarizai with us from Research Center of Imm uh, Immunodeficiency, University, uh, Universal Scientific Education and Research Network, or USER, uh, Children's Medical Center, Primary Immunodeficiency Disease Network, Tehran University of Medical Science, on the subject of approach to children with congenital neutropenia. Uh, and Professor Mahbube Mahdavinia uh, from Allergy and Immunology uh, Division, Department of Internal Medicine, Research Director, Rush uh, Center of uh, Sinusitis, Allergies and Asthma, uh, Rush University of Medical Science, uh, Chicago on the subject of diet, environment, and microbiome, what is their role in pediatric atopic conditions. Professor Oksana Burchek, Department of Children's Disease and Pediatric Surgery, Chernobyl National Medical uh, University, Ukraine, on the subject of allergic manifestations uh, of primary immunodeficiency disease and its treatment approaches. Uh, and uh, Professor Ariza Ranchbar, Director of uh, Institute of Interventional uh, Allergology and Immun Immunology, uh, Bonn, Germany, on the subject of uh, molecular pediatric in context of clinical pediatrics today and tomorrow. Uh, I would like to take a moment to thank uh, our speakers, our dearest panelists for joining us today. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Vice Chancellor for Global Strategies and International Affairs, uh, Directorate of International Relations uh, of the Tehran University of Medical Science for giving me the privilege to patron this important event. And uh, I would, uh, and uh, let me, Uh, I also would like to thank our dearest audience for joining this event. And I gotta tell you, uh, we weren't here if it wasn't for Dr. Zia and Dr. Ari. Thank you for uh, so much for making this all happen for us. Uh, Dr. Ari wants to talk a few words with you. Uh, Dr. Ari, please, we are all ears. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I also want to thank uh, all of our uh, lecturers and also uh, audiences for their their time. Um, uh, I won't go for each name, but uh, thanks from uh, the executive on behalf of the executive committee here in Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Thank you for your time. And let's start this uh, wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ari. Uh, a few reminders before we get started. This webinar is broadcasting live on YouTube channel. A recorded version of this webinar will be available on our website. Information about our social media is provided on the chat section due to the number of participants. Please make sure that you have muted your microphone during the lectures. And if you have any questions, we encourage you to ask them by chat section. Please feel free to ask questions uh, at any point during the presentations using the chat section at the bottom right of your screen. We will reserve time at the end of each presentation to answer your questions. Uh, we would like, uh, we would do our best to answer as many questions as possible throughout today's event. If you want to receive a certificate of attendance uh, uh, on this Congress, make sure to register on your, our website and reserve a seat on your desired panel. For our Iranian audience, if you want to receive CME credits, don't uh, forget to participate in the panel quiz in maximum of two days on cmequiz.ir. Don't forget to follow us on so our social media pages and YouTube channel to stay updated on our next events. And with that, we will open today's webinar. We are very lucky to have uh, with us uh, today, Professor Nima Rezae. Professor Rezae, we are all ears. 
Thank you. Thank you, Azim, for your nice introduction, and thanks, Ehsan, for all you did for the, I mean, organizing such an amazing uh, Congress, making international meeting. Okay, so uh, let me share my screen. And uh, I do not know if you can see my slide or not. Uh, we can see your slides, sir, but uh, there is a little uh, problem with your voice. I think uh, uh, you should uh, just uh, change your headset or uh, something like that. Uh, is it okay or not? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, let me let me ask my other colleagues about the voice. Uh, is it okay with you? The... Professor, I have your voice uh, very well. Please continue. If okay, you... okay. Sorry. Okay, I'll just great. continue. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. It's actually my pleasure to present a lecture uh, regarding approach to neutropenia uh, in the 32nd uh, International Congress of Pediatrics. Uh, first, I would like to mention some points about the phagocytic system. And as you know, the phagocytic system is the, uh, I mean, the most important part of the innate immunity. And neutropenia, as low absolute neutrophic count, is the most common phagocytic defect. So neutropenia could be defined as uh, the, I mean, low number of absolute neutrophic count with less than 1,500. And we can classify neutropenia to severe neutropenia as neutrophic count of less than 500 or moderate as 500 to 1,000 and might as 1,000 to 1,500. So if you name uh, a patient with severe neutropenia, it means that the patient has absolute neutrophic count of less than 500. And in paid production, peripheral dysfunction and ab abnormal distribution of the neutrophils could be the uh, reason for uh, neutropenia in affected patients. So if you look at this slide from the textbook of the primary indeficiency, which was published a few years ago, uh, at the left, you can see this is the bone marrow and you can see that the poor myelocyte could mature to myelocyte and then mature to neutrophil in the circulation. And then uh, neutrophil should uh, circulate in the circulation and then do diabetes and get the pathogen inside and digest and then make apoptosis. So, Please consider that if we have some problem in maturation areas, it means that at the left side, uh, if we cannot see the, I mean, the myelocyte enough, we will have some kind of neutropenia. But if we have enough neutrophil in the circulation and they have some problems in uh, rolling, uh, it leads to another disease which we name leukocyte antigen deficiency or LAD. And in another disease, if we have, uh, I mean, enough neutrophil, neutrophil could circulate in the, I mean, blood and then do a diabetes and get the pathogen inside, but cannot digest the pathogen, then other immune system could help the, the uh, macrophage and make a granulome. So we name the disease as chronic granulomatosis disease or CGD. So we could see the, I mean, the pathophysiology of disease by this slide. Neutropenia could be classified to two kinds of uh, congenital and acquired neutropenia, and acquired has some, uh, uh, what's wrong with the slide? I do not know what happened, but the acquired could be due to the infection, malignancy, malnutrition, immune-related uh, or increased distraction. And uh, so I, I do not know what happened with the slide. Uh, maybe one of the, I mean, audience may, such shape. So let me just try to see. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, there is some inconvenience with uh, with the slide that we are not sure what's the problem with that, because uh, we do not have anyone uh, co-hosted other than the lecturers. 
So if you can just uh, um, forget the problem and continue, because uh, I think we cannot do anything more of that. I just stop sharing and then, I mean, share again. So I think the problem is solved. Thank now. you. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So as I mentioned that uh, the topenia could be classified into two uh, types of congenital and acquired. And the congenital nutopenia could be classified as non-synonymic nutopenia, alcoholocutanous hypopigmentation and nutopenia, pancreatic insufficiency plus nutopenia, combined immunodeficiency, metabolic disease, bone marrow aplasia, and other synonymic nutopenia. So they could be as a, I mean, new classification for congenital nutopenia. As I mentioned, my uh, talk is about congenital nutopenia, but if you look at this slide, you can see that uh, infection associated with neutropenia could be due to bacterial infection, some viral infection, or malignancies like leukemia, lymphoma, or malnutrition like copper deficiency, B12 deficiency, or folate deficiency, and some drug-induced uh, neutropenia and some other conditions. So there are some diseases which could be associated to uh, acquired neutropenia. And if you look at this slide, in subcategory of disease, when we mention non-syndromic neutropenia, it could be either severe congenital neutropenia, uh, which could be as a autosomal dominant like uh, a GP1 deficiency or Elaine as a sporadic deficiency, or severe congenital neutropenia in autosomal recessive form, which is the Kassman syndrome, uh, which could be due to HAX1 deficiency, X-linked neutropenia as uh, I mean, a WASP mutation as X-linked neutropenia and cyclic neutropenia. In the category of oculocutanous hypopigmentation or albinism with neutropenia, we could mention some diseases like Chediac Higashi syndrome, Gishali syndrome type 2, Hemansi Padlock syndrome type 2, and P14 deficiency. In pancreatic insufficiency, I can name Schwachmann Diamond syndrome as an immunodeficiency associated with neutropenia, but we have Pearson Marrow syndrome, which is not immunodeficiency, but again could be associated with uh, congenital neutropenia. In the category of combined immunodeficiency, CD40 ligand deficiency, VIM syndrome, which is abbreviation of the WART, hypogamma immunodeficiency, and myelocatexis, and neutropenia, reticular dyskinesia, and cartilage hay hypoplasia, all, all, uh, I mean, all are combined immunodeficiency associated with neutropenia. <coughs> and in metabolic disease, I can name glycogenesterate disease type 1B. We have also some other diseases like GATA2 deficiency or monomax syndrome and dyskratosis congenita. And in syndromic neutropenia, I can mention some diseases like G6PC3 syndrome, Cohen syndrome, VAR syndrome, and poikiloderma with neutropenia. So these are, I mean, there's some subclassification of congenital neutropenia. And if you look at this slide, I just mentioned some congenital neutropenia, which are all associated with uh, primary immunodeficiency diseases. So I start with severe congenital neutropenia, also known as Kassman syndrome in autosomal recessive form. As I mentioned, the, the patients usually have severe neutropenia, persistent severe neutropenia. So absolute neutrophic count is less than 500. They have increased susceptibility to infection, early onset of bacterial infection. And if we look at the bone marrow slide, we will see that they have some uh, maturation areas from poor myocyte to myelocyte. These patients usually uh, suffer from some abscesses in different organs, uh, cutaneous infection, pneumonia, oral ulcers, omphalitis, and otitis media. And they could also suffer from some diarrhea, respiratory infection, and mucocutaneous infection during the course of disease. So there are several gene defects associated with neutropenia, like Elaine or ILA2, GFI1, which is autosomal dominant, HAX1, VPS45, JAGM1, G6PC3, and VASP, which are some genes which are associated with uh, severe congenital neutropenia. So this is the, one of the historical papers which we had the chance to publish in 2007. And as uh, I can mention that the Kassman syndrome or autosomal recessive form of neutropenia was uh, introduced by uh, Dr. Kassman in 1956 but the gene was discovered five decades later, which was a collaborative study, and I'm very proud to be a part of this paper, which was published in Nature Genetics. So if you look at, I mean, how we could, I mean, make some progress in, uh, I mean, discovery and make some progress in treatment of the patient, it could be due to, I mean, some kind of international collaboration. 
So again, if you look at this slide, you would see that the uh, Hax1 and Elaine both could, uh, I mean, accelerate apoptosis as uh, in myeloid uh, progenital cells of the patient. And uh, we, uh, I mean, after the, the historical paper, we realized that the Hax1 Uh, dear Dr. Rezaei, we lost your voice. Uh, I think we... Oh, okay. Your voice is back. Your voice is back. Okay. Okay, sorry. Uh, so no the... the uh, uh, sir, uh, sir, sorry. I, 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 think, uh, I think you are facing some, uh, uh, some inter internet inconveniences. Uh, uh, so... Uh, uh, if uh, I interrupt you, uh, I, I, will, I will apologize for, uh, for if I will interrupt you because of that, okay? So okay, let's continue. Okay, that's perfect, that's perfect. Okay. So can you hear me? Yeah, now, now it's okay. Okay, 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 sorry about that. So I, I mentioned that, for example, we had a patient with some kind of uh, convulsion and epilepsy, and we found that the case has some kind of neutropenia as well. So it was just a coincidental, uh, I mean, association of Hax1 deficiency and neurological disorder. But later on, we realized that, I mean, the Hax1 has two transcripts and we published this paper in the blood journal. So this is a case with uh, some kind of recurrent pneumonia, recurrent diarrhea, and oral candidiasis. But if you look at the, this story, this case was initially was, uh, I mean, underwent some cardiac surgery by a cardiac surgeon due to AST, atrial septal defect. And later on, the patient was, uh, I mean, affected by some kind of rectovaginal fistula. So it was not a pure notopenia. If you look at the CBC of the case, you can see that the absolute notopenia kind of, I mean, the cases were moderate to, I mean, severe notopenia in all conditions. And if you look at this table, so you can see that, I mean, we have several gene defects and we have several, I mean, clinical manifestation. So I would like to emphasize that we should put all the data on the desk to make the best diagnosis. So if you look at it here, you can see that the patient has some kind of cardiovascular system disease. So this kind of disease. And if you look at, I mean, come down and you can see that the patient has some kind of congenital neutropenia, has some skeletal problem, has some delayed dysmorphic, I mean, a skin hair. So orogenital system malformation, which is unique for other, I mean, diseases. And the diagnosis of G6PC3 syndrome for, was made for this patient. And we found the mutation in this case, and we had the chance to publish this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine as a new syndrome with congenital neutropenia and some kind of uh, I mean, congenital heart disease and all genital malformation. And just a few years ago, we just described another gene defect, JAGN1 deficiency, which is also again associated with some kind of congenital neutropenia. So these are all about congenital neutropenia. But we, I mean, visit some patients which has some kind of periodic neutropenia. They have, I mean, uh, about three to six days of neutropenia with, with the cycle of three weeks. 20, 21 day. And during neutropenia, they could also have some kind of cyclic anemia and cyclic monocytopenia as well. And we found that Elaine or ELA2 could be, I mean, responsible for cyclic neutropenia. Another disease is, is uh, oculocutanous hyperpigmentation uh, or albinism with immunodeficiency. And there are some diseases like Chediac Egashi syndrome, Grishali syndrome type 2, Hemocyparthax syndrome type 2, P14 deficiency deficiency and VC syndrome, they are all, I mean, associated with neutropenia and some kind of albinism. So just uh, two decades ago, I mean, any patient with some kind of albinism just resembles some diseases like Chediac Egashi syndrome. But later on, we realized that, for example, a disease like Grishali syndrome type 2, which you can see this in a slide with uh, silvery hair, eyelash, and eyeball uh, could be, I mean, even more common in some, uh, I mean, the region with uh, consanguineous marriages. Again, if you look at this, uh, this table and see the dif I mean, the difference between these diseases, you can see, for example, this row. For example, in Chediac Higashi syndrome, they have disturbed regular melanin. 
But in glycerol type two, they have a large irregular melanin. So there is no need to, I mean, do exome sequencing for all the patient. You could do some simple tests like uh, checking the microscopic hair shaft of the patient. In a patient with Chedia Higashi syndrome, they have giant granules, giant cellular granules. So if you could just check the purified blood smear, we will find that they have giant granules, which is, I mean, unique for Chedia Higashi syndrome and it's way for other conditions. So this is the hair shaft of the disease. Uh, at the right side, you can see a console. This is the Chedia Higashi syndrome with irregular, and this is the Griselli syndrome with some, uh, I mean, mel melanin at the middle of the hair shaft. Another disease is Wim syndrome. This is what hypogamma immunodeficiency and myelocatexia, but we should be very careful about the diagnosis because some of the disease, some of the patient are not old enough to, I mean, develop what. So I have, I mean, some cases who had some kind of neutropenia because of myelocatexis, infection, and some kind of hypogamma. So I just criticized this name as Wim syndrome or HIM syndrome or CXCR4 deficiency as a new, I mean, uh, genetic name for such kind of phenotype. Another disease is Schwachmann diamond syndrome, which uh, we usually, I mean, know these cases with some kind of pancreatic insufficiency and some kind of neutropenia. They have some kind of skeletal abnormalities like, uh, like pec pectus ductus, some gross retardation, some dental caries, no developmental delay and hepatic dysfunction. And if you just do, I mean, uh, uh, sonography of this case, uh, we will find that they have some white pancreas because the pancreas is, uh, I mean, uh, affected because of the lipomatosis. So it is very, uh, I mean, uh, essential to do sonography and uh, see the, the defect in pancreatic, uh, I mean, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency in those patients. Another disease is cartilage hair hypoplasia. I mean, uh, it's clear from the name that they have some uh, short limb, short stature, some metaphysial chondrodysplasia. They have hypoplastic uh, hair. They have macrocytic anemia, and they have some laxity in the ligaments. Uh, and uh, they have also some uh, kind of neutropenia. They are also predisposed to some kind of cancer as well. So if I plan to just list the diseases, with other phagocyte defect and associated with neutropenia. I can also mention some diseases like glycogen storage disease type 1B, BAS syndrome. They have some kind of heart failure, some skeletal myopathy, cognitive uh, impairment and gross retardation. Cohen syndrome, they have some kind of hypotonia, hypotonia, obesity, and retinopathy. And coecloderma with neutropenia, which uh, could, I mean, be associated with some kind of tonagectasia as well. And other PIDs associated with neutropenia, I can mention some kind of CD40 ligand deficiency, which is extinct form of hyper-IGM syndrome. So this is some kind of uh, immunoglobulin class switch recombination deficiency, which means that IgM cannot class switch to IgG and IgA. So IgG and IgA are low, but IgM could be normal or increased. So that's why we mentioned the disease as hyper-IgM syndrome. And the CD40 ligand deficiency is usually associated with neutropenia as well. Reticular dyskinesia and dyskeratosis congenita are two other diseases, two other primary immunodeficiency diseases associated with neutropenia. Glycogen storage disease type 1B, BAS syndrome, dyskeratosis congenita, Cohen syndrome, poikilidema with neutropenia, and reticular dyskinesis are some other diseases. So how we could make suspicious to neutropenia? So it's, I mean, very simple. Just, I mean, checking the CBC, just regular CBC. And if, if you find that the patient has severe neutropenia, we should repeat it at least, uh, I mean, three times for six weeks to, to six weeks to see that if this is the cyclic neutropenia and, uh, or severe neutropenia, severe persistent neutropenia. And early diagnosis and appropriate treatment are the keys to uh, make the, I mean, early diagnosis and uh, do appropriate treatment for this patient. So we should exclude secondary neutropenia, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, and we should check the bone marrow to, to find out if the case has, uh, I mean, maturation arrest or not. We should do some immunological studies to exclude other immunodeficiency diseases associated with neutropenia. 
And then after making the diagnosis, there is a new need to make the treatment. So GCSF, granulocyte colonial stimulating factor, could be the best diagnosis pro uh, protocol for the patient with, not with, with severe notopenia. And uh, we should be, I mean, uh, also consider some antibacterial or like cotemoxazole or antifungal if necessary. And bone marrow transplantation or hematopoietic stem cell transplant transplantation might be needed if the patient do not respond to GCSF or if the patient continues severe bacterial infection despite receiving GCSF or the patient is getting complicated with AML or myelin dysplasia. These are the indication of the hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for the patient with notopenia. So there's no need to do I mean, uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for all the patient with severe congenital neutropenia. And for the follow-up, we should uh, do uh, make follow-up at least twice per year to check the CBC. There is a need to check the dental cavity and also anus lesion to uh, because they, 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 they I mean, both lesions are full of uh, pathogen, and we should be very careful about uh, about it. Checking CBC every three months and checking, uh, I mean, bone marrow uh, because of, uh, I mean, morpho to check the morphology and cytology uh, because they are, I mean, prone to AML or myelin dysplasia might be needed. And uh, in some uh, cases, GCSF receptor analysis uh, might be needed because they have, uh, there's some reports that, uh, I mean, GCF receptor could be, uh, could make some mutation and then in this case, uh, I mean, EMT might be needed. So if you look at this slide from the top to the left, this is some kind of infection. First, we should check the CBC. If the patient has severe persistent notopenia, we should do approach to congenital defects of phagocytes, as I mentioned, as syndromic or non-syndromic, as I mentioned in uh, my presentation. But if the patient has normal absolute notofit count, uh, no, no, normal absolute notofit count, we should check NBT or DHR, nitrobolutetrazolium test or dehydrolamine test to exclude CGD or chronic granulomatous disease. And if uh, it's intact, we could check uh, chemotaxis test or some other, uh, I mean, phyllocytomarker like CD18 or CD15 for LAD type one or LAD type two. And there are some other motility defects in this slide as well. So uh, I'm very pleased that I'm working in the Children's Medical Center Hospital, the Pediatric Center of Excellence in Taylor University of Medical Sciences. And we have also a research center, uh, the Research Center for Immunodeficiencies, which we could do some genetic diagnosis, prenatal diagnosis and genetic counseling. And we could do mutation analysis of HAX1, Elaine, CD40 ligand, G6PC3, UBAS. The genes that I mentioned in my slide could be, uh, I mean, checked in, in the research center in, uh, in the Children's Medical Center hospitals. So uh, what I mentioned is uh, from the textbook of primary immunodeficiency diseases. This is the second edition of the book. And I would like to emphasize that when I edited this book in 2008, it was only uh, about, I mean, 150 to 200 different primary immunodeficiency diseases. But nowadays, there are more than 400 diseases. It means that during, I mean, less than one decade, the number of primary immunodeficiency diseases are increased more than twice. So it highlights that how much is important to, I mean, keep ourselves up to date to all the diseases, all the gene defects, all defects and all clinical manifestation of the patient. So I just briefly mentioned about the approach to neutropenia and thank you for your attention. If you have any question, I would be more than happy to answer. Thank you, Professor Zayu, for an enlightening presentation on approach uh, to children with congenital neutropenia. We appreciate having this mysterious area clarified. Uh, next, we will have Professor Mahdavinia to tell us about diet, uh, environment, and microbiome. What is their role in pediatric atopic conditions? Professor Mahdavinia, hi. Thanks for joining us today. Hello. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Um, so as I said, I appreciate if you could play the recorder. 
Uh, hi, Professor. Yes, uh, we are going to uh, play your uh, pre-recorded presentation. Uh, our team is working on it. Thank you very much. I'm an allergist, immunologist, uh, and a physician scientist at Rush University Medical Center. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk today. Uh, it's an honor um, to par participate in your great Congress. So today I'm going to talk about how changes in the diet environment and the gut microbiome in early childhood can predispose a child to atopic and allergic conditions. Next, please. Um, the learning objectives will, will be to focus about learning uh, what is hygiene hypothesis and how diet can influence the gut microbiome and um, to understand the link between the changes in the environment and predisposition to allergy in early childhood. Next, please. Um, hygiene hypothesis was this very interesting genius idea that was um, put forward about um, two and a half decade, uh, decades ago that microbes are good for the health of human being and are protective against allergic diseases. And this protective effect uh, seemed to be coming from living in a farm. The idea came from an observation in Switzerland when they compared the children who were raised in Swiss Alps in a farm in a situation very similar to the picture you're seeing. So a, an infant is being raised inside a barn very close um, to the animals and in proximity to all the microbes in the environment. Uh, and they compared the rate of allergic diseases in those children to those with the very similar genetic background that were raised in Zurich, which is a modern industrial city. Um, the rate of allergic diseases was almost three times in children who were raised in Zurich. Uh, so the idea was that maybe being raised in a farm is protective against development of this type of conditions. Next, please. And then the next studies started looking at what actually changes with moving from an a rural area to an urban industrial area is the microbiome, which is the colony of all the bacteria and um, other microorganisms that live within and on the surface of human being. Um, and it appears that they are actually a very important part of our immune system and they have a role in protecting us against allergic diseases. But their development in a human takes about three years from the time that the infant is born, and that is dependent on the individual's exposure to surrounding environment. So at some point as humans, we forgot that we are animals too, and we need to live in nature and in close proximity to the microbes in the nature. Next, please. And the next set of experiments and research after that started looking to see what are the bacteria in the farm that are protective and actually in mouse models they could find at least three specific species of bacteria that in the mice um, could grow from a farmland environment in the gut of a mice and protect them against development of severe allergic conditions. Next slide please. The gut microbiome, so the group of all the microorganisms inside the intestine of an individual is proposed to be possible contributor to this increase. And so at that point, we understood that the diversity of this microbial exposure is inversely associated with the development of allergic diseases, meaning 
that we need to be exposed to not only specific bacteria, but a very large quality and quant uh, quantity of the microorganisms to develop the healthy gut microbiome. Next. So these are observations that have been seen throughout the Western, at least, countries. And following that, we're seeing the same trend in the whole world, that all atopic conditions are in rise. So in the past three decades, there have been almost a doubling in the rate of food allergy, anaphylaxis related to um, food or drug allergy, even rate of eczema, asthma, and allergic rhinitis. And it is now thought that the environmentally induced change in the commensal microbiome in the gut is what's driving this rapid increase in the allergic responses. And that, in a nutshell, is what hygiene hypothesis. So we change the environment, we change the way we live, we decrease our, our exposure, hence we were predisposed to allergic diseases. The focus of my line of study was how the changes in the diet can affect the gut microbiome in a way that predisposes a child to allergic diseases. So in this picture, as you can see, these children on the left side of the picture are living in a very natural setting. They're eating a fruit picked from a tree as they are going around without washing their hands and running and active and eating those type of fruits and diet. On the right is the modern child that's in front of the TV, not active enough, while eating things that are called food, but they're far from foods, highly processed material from food sources that by that point do not look like anything like food anymore. And that unfortunately has become the mainstay of everyday diet of most children throughout the world. So we wanted to see that shift in the diet, how can that impact the gut microbiome? Next. And in this study, we actually chose to study an African population. Um, the reason was, it was, I had a personal reason when I was a PhD student, um, my, I was a PhD student in genetic epidemiology and my main supervisor always told us that if you want to answer a question, you have to go to the source of where that change happened. And African continent is where human race was born. So it was interesting to look at the children who were still in Africa, which are highly protective against any type of allergic disease. The rate is very, very low in most African uh, parts, especially in South Africa and the part that is um, rural and untouched. And we wanted to compare those to the children from African ancestry, like African Americans, who are actually the, have the highest rate of allergic diseases and the most severe types of allergic diseases. So we hypothesized that probably there's something in their diet and environment that is keeping their allergic genes in check for centuries. And it would be very interesting to find those keys because that could be now implemented uh, for the whole world. Next, please. And in certain areas of Africa, people still live in very close daily contact with animals and in within the nature. So determining those uh, factors would have been really interesting um, for our study. Next. Um, so we, we collaborated with Cape Town University in South Africa and um, looked at the children, a group of children from a certain tribe in South Africa that live in remote rural district of the Eastern Cape. Um, we had a group of them that had developed atopic dermatitis. So this was very interesting because the atopic dermatitis, which is abbreviated as AD in these slides, is very rare in that area. So it would be very interesting to see what has happened to that children in that um, villages that they developed 
eczema and compare them to a group of controlled children that we recruited. In, uh, actually, we had to stay in tents uh, in that area because there was no place to stay beside the houses that they have made um, from completely from clay and um, wood, as you can see in the picture, and recruited these patients for our study. Um, they're children from rural Cape area. So we had 83 children altogether, 36 from with atopic dermatitis and 47 controls. Everybody was tested for a panel of food and environmental allergens. Um, and the first observation was that atopic dermatitis was significantly associated with food sensitization, uh, but not with allergic rhinitis. So these, most of these children with eczema also had evidence for being sensitized to food. None of them were food allergic. So having a positive test does not necessarily mean that child is allergic to the food. As long as they're tolerating it, there's this mechanism, immune mechanism we call tolerance that we know it's active. But that's the first step to development of food allergy. So that's an alarming that these children with eczema, even in that rural areas, are significantly at higher risk of food allergy now. Um, but the interesting part was that there was no link to allergic rhinitis, which we see within the rest of the world. Next, please. And we, so we had this dietary intakes, a very detailed dietary intake survey uh, from few days of their, what they exactly had eaten and could come up with um, collaboration with the dietitian that what are the exact components of, of the diet that's different between the two population. So the children with atopic dermatitis group had significantly higher daily consumption of total sugar and saturated fat compared to the control children. These are children from the same exact villages. So really there's not much different and the food is not coming from outside. So that means that within the same diet, if you go really high on the total simple sugar and saturated fats, the rate of allergic diseases increases, uh, which is, was a very actually interesting observation because the most of the previous studies were comparing children from two different societies and looking at their diet, but within the same society, we were reproducing the same data. And another interesting point was that breastfeeding didn't have an impact on eczema. Next, I'm gonna talk about the microbiome analysis on this group. Um, so this is a, part, uh, is a simple figure showing how microbiome analysis is done. We start with the microbial community samples we amplify those to generate multiple strains of each bacteria we have, and then generate these lines, compare that to a national database to see what each bacteria group belong to, and then create this phylogeny or relative abundance figures that you can see on the bottom. So I'm gonna talk about bacteria. I'm actually talking about that figure down there when, um, when we get to that slide. Next, please. And the bacterial classification starts with the kingdom of bacteria. And after that is phyla, which is the first grouping. We come down, get to the genus and species. 16S microbial analysis are best up until we talk about the genus of bacteria. We could talk about species, but whenever I talk about the species, uh, we have double checked that with specific PCR to make sure that is the bacteria that we have observed. Next, please. Okay. And this is, this is like, shows you what is diversity in microbiome when we talk about. So when we talk about richness, we're simply saying how many types of bacteria are in this sample we have. Community A has six samples, very simplified, six bacteria, that's the richness. Evenness is how even this number of bacteria are distributed, but Shannon and Simpson index that are the diversity indices are actually mathematical models based on these differences. So when somebody talks about diversity, this is a multifactorial mathematical number we're talking about. And the diversity being higher is always better for a bacterial community. 
Next, please. All right, so I'm going to jump to the most important finding in our study. So when we compare the rural atopic dermatitis uh, children to controls, we found one specific bacteria called Prevotella copri that was significantly reduced in children with atopic dermatitis. And in comparison to that, there was another bacteria called Bactero Bacteroides vulgatus that was significantly higher in children with eczema. This is the results of months of study looking at thousands of species and genus of bacteria. And this was the one that after correction for multiple analysis still stood out. So at this point, we were sure that there is, this is P. copri is a key bacteria that is protective in these children against eczema. Next slide, please. Um, and interestingly, we understood that the high simple sugar content in the diet was associated with lower bacterial diversity. So off the chart, we knew it was associated with eczema and we understood that it was also associated with lower bacterial diversity. Next, please. And interestingly, picopri itself was associated with lower intake of fat. So high saturated fat intake was associated with lower abundance of picopri in these children. Next. And I'm just showing you one of the like, sample of analysis. These are all the factors that we took into account. This is actually one tenth of the factors that we took into account coming to those previous slides that showed you that the most important ones was picopri and increased saturated fat in the microbiome analysis. Next, please. Okay, so the, uh, the next set of studies was after we understood that picopri is important, is linked to diet, we expanded our study and recruited a group of children from urban Cape Town, same exact tribe of children who were raised in an urban setting and had developed eczema or not. And we compared their microbiome to the children from rural area. So as you can see, the gut microbiome differed significantly between rural and urban ch children in this South African study. But the interesting part that these are gen completely genetically ident uh, identical children that now develop significantly diverse microbiome depending on where they are raised. Next study, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. And these are the four groups. So we had also children with eczema or atopic dermatitis from Cape Town. And the four groups microbiome stands in four different discrete groups. So having eczema shifts your microbiome towards the left side and they're living in an urban environment shifts your microbiome to the higher side in this slide. And that was, this was a very important finding at this point that urban environment changes the microbiome and there's a group, a subgroup of changes that result in atopic dermatitis. Next, please. And the relative abundance of picopri, as you can see here, significantly is reduced in urban children. So just living in an urban environment, you lose that protective bacteria in the gut. Next, please. Um, we corrected our analysis with the, for the prevalence of Provotella as a genus in general, because Provotella is linked to a vegetarian diet. And we wanted to know if urban and rural children had a completely different diet. And it, is, it seems that it's not because they are the distribution of the genus are very similar, but it's that specific picopri that reduces in the rural children of Cape Town. Next slide, please. So in summary, toddlers with atopic dermatitis had significantly higher sugar and fat. Higher sugar was associated with decreased diversity of gut microbiome that is itself associated with atopic dermatitis. High fat intake is associated with decreased relative abundance of picopri, which is associated with lower risk of atopic dermatitis. And the rural children in South Africa have significantly low, 
lower rate of allergic diseases, including atopic dermatitis. Um, and we also understood that the rule of fat uh, diet had less fat and sugar, and the gut microbiome was more diverse and had more P coping. Next slide, please. Um, so the next study, we recruited a group of African children with similar ancestry from South African children that have, uh, were born and raised in Chicago and compared their gut microbiome to the ones in South Africa. And so ASA is African, South African, because as you know, South African have white uh, population too. So we call them ASA in, in these studies that we're calling African Americans, AA. As you can see off the beginning of the study, there's significant further shift. So African American children are at significantly higher risk for development of allergic diseases. That's a fact. We see it in Chicago. They're the highest risk population. But also compared to the South Africans, their gut microbiome is completely uh, lacking the diversity needed in a child's microbiome. Next slide, please. And the relative uh, abundance of Provotella is very low. So except four children, the rest of them had almost none Provotella. This is very, very alarming for anybody who studies microbiome. So this is a very important genus of bacteria protecting children, not only against allergic diseases, but all inflammatory diseases that almost disappeared from the gut microbiome of African-American children. Next slide, please. And then we looked at the gen in more in-depth analysis to see really what's driving the gut microbiome changes and Provotella in any type of analysis we did stood really high, uh, that that's actually um, an important bacteria that has been lost in the gut of these children. Next slide, please. And that's more going to the species of bacteria. So this is a second type after the 16S, we did a more in-depth analysis and as you can see, the first line called OTU12 Provotella copri again stood out. So this key bacteria that we had understood that is a very important key protective bacteria in the gut microbiome of toddlers is lost in African-American children. Next slide. And this is not surprising. So we, in this group, we have compared the children from Africa, South African, rural, urban, with African Americans. If you come down at the bottom, you can see the rate of food sensitization is almost double in African American. Then the allergic rhinitis is almost 10 times in African American children compared to rural South African, and more than double in urban, of urban. And the rate of wheezing, which is the predisposing asthma condition, which is zero in rural South Africans is 17% in urban African-American children. And this is not surprising in the context of the microbiome. So next slide, please. Yes, thanks. Um, so in this paradigm, you're saying that for a child to develop atopic diseases and especially allergy, there is a component of microbiome that's necessary on top, a healthy diet that's necessary that sort of protects the inflammatory cascade, shift them toward the tolerance, which is you see in the left side. But once, um, can you press next? Oh, thank you. So once that is blocked because of the shifts in the diet or environment, the pickup is dropped, uh, blocked, then that shifts to development of atopic dermatitis and food allergy in children. Next slide, please. So the, there are more studies that we did, and I'm gonna go through this much a little faster. We looked at the environment and what's in the dust in the houses of these children at this point. Um, so same children, same, not exact same children, but same uh, groups of children. We looked at their dust environment. We actually vacuumed um, where they sleep and looked at the microbiome in the environment and compared those four groups. Next, please. And as you can see, the urban versus rural houses had significantly different microbiome 
um, in the diversity index. Next, please. And they beautifully dispersed in the uh, break cortis matrix. Almost there's no overlap of what is in the microbiome of a house of a child in rural area versus of the microbiome in the house of a child in living in the urban Cape Town city. Next, please. And we, are, we could actually discover three specific species of bacteria that their relative abundance was linked to the atopic dermatitis as and were significantly reduced in urban area, meaning those protective bacteria in the environment were very important. And once they decreased the chance of development of allergic diseases, significantly went up in these children. Next, please. And that's the four groups. Again, now this is atopic dermatitis versus controlled children. So those who had atopic dermatitis um, that are red, use, as you can see, group different from the ones who did not have, who control, who did not have any allergic condition. Next, please. And again, this type of secondary analysis could show us that there's two main Clostridia bacteria that are in the environment and they're key in protecting against eczema. Next, please. So in summary, we found the increased levels of Dromenococcus and Lachnospratia in rural house, and we found increased levels of Rominococci uh, in the homes of healthy rural children. So it is linked to eczema and it is uh, link to living in the urban setting. Next slide, please. So we could move forward one more. Next, please. So Clostridia bacteria might be the link of environment, gut microbiome, and allergy. And the previous studies have shown actually Clostridia is important in keeping the inflammatory pathway in check. So there, are, and our set of studies are showing that the increased level in the gut is associated with increased level uh, of them in the environment. And once the house dec has decreased level of this clostridia, the chance of allergy increases. Next slide, please. Um, can you press next so the, the rest of the, thank you, and next please, awesome. One more time. All right, so not only shift in the gut through changes in the microbiome, if the diet changes can shift the child to atopic condition, there are certain bacteria in the house thus that belong to the Clostridia family that are very important as protective factors. And once that block, that shifts the child to development of atopic dermatitis. Um, next, please. And with that, I would like to thank you again um, for listening to me and I would take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Professor Mahdavinia, for your great, spectacular presentation and the useful information you gave us. Uh, just one question um, I wanted to ask you. Uh, up to what age can we expect uh, nutrition to be able to prevent uh, dermatitis, uh, uh, atopia dermatitis? So we believe that this is through infancy, most likely. And maybe we have a chance until age of three, but after that, shifting the microbiome by dietary changes is extremely difficult because the gut um, develops something that they call microbiome memory and sort of sticks back to how it was even after dietary changes. Thank you very much, Professor, for your answer. And uh, thank you again for your uh, spectacular presentation. Of course. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so we shall proceed uh, pr to discussion with Professor Oksana Burchek, uh, if I uh, pronounce it uh, in the correct way. Uh, 
uh, Professor Burchak, could you please define the allergic manifestation of primary immunodeficiency disease and instrument approaches? Thank you. Professor, we don't have your voice. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. Yes. Thank you. Do you hear me? Do you see? Yes, uh, yes, good, evening. Uh, good, good evening, dear colleagues. Thank you for the invitation for participate in the uh, 32nd International Congress on Pediatrics. My name is Oksana Berchuk. And I am from Ukraine, Ivan Gorbachevsky Ternopil National Medical University. And I would like to present my report, Allergic Manifestation of Primary Immunodeficiency Diseases and Its Treatment Approaches. As we know, primary immunodeficiencies uh, are a group of uh, diseases caused by genetic defects, and they are characterized by recurrent infections and certain immunological phenotypes. Currently, we know more than uh, 450 uh, primary immunodeficiency. And during the last 30 years, the number of primary immunodeficiencies increased from 20 to more than 400 in born errors. And as we say about primary immunodeficiency, we mean firstly infection. But besides infections, primary immunodeficiency is also characterized by autoimmunity, by allergy, and by malignancy. And according to the 2019 update on the classification from the International Union of Immunological Society Expert Committee, uh, primary immunodeficiency are classified into 10 major groups. And they include combined immunodeficiencies, combined immunodeficiencies with syndromic features, predominantly antibody deficiencies, disease of, of immune dysregulation, congenital defects of phagocytosis, defects of innate immunity, autoinflammatory diseases, complement deficiencies, pinocopias of inborn errors of immunity, and genes that cause bone marrow failure. Allergic manifestations in patients with primary immunodeficiency characterized by eczema, eosinophilia, increased IgE levels, asthma, uh, and other allergic manifestations. And uh, uh, allergic manifestation occurred in um, such groups of primary immunodeficiencies as combined immunodeficiency and firstly in patients with dog H deficiency and Omen syndrome, in patients with some autoinflammatory disorders, in patients with uh, antibody deficiency, in patients with immune dysregulation, but most often allergic manifestations occurred in patients with uh, combined immunodeficiency with syndromic features. And combined immunodeficiency with syndromic features includes group of hyper IgE syndromes and they consist of an, uh, syndromes or and diseases. Autosomal dominant hyper IgE STAT3 deficiency or DOC syndrome, interleukin-6 receptor deficiency, interleukin-6 signal transducer deficiency, ZNF341 deficiency, autosomal recessive hyper-IgE deficiency, Erbin deficiency, LIS this syndrome, Omel-Nizerton syndrome, GM3 Efficiency and car me because unstable internet. Do you hear me? Okay. Autosomal dominant uh, hyper uh, IgE uh, syndrome or STAT3 deficiency or DOC syndrome is um, uh, well known 
and allergic manifestation in this syndrome is well described. But Dup syndrome is not only a copy, it characterized by triad. And this triad include recurrent staphylococcal buoyance of all staphylococcal abscesses, pneumonias that develop post infection pneumocellus, and extreme elevation of serum IgE. But besides this triad, Block syndrome is characterized by non immune features and, as of all, characteristic facial abnormalities such as facial symmetry, hypercolorism, broad nose, deep set eyes, and prominent forehead. It is also characterized by dental abnormalities such as fail to lose their primary teeth, and these patients have two sets um, of teeth simultaneously, as we can see in this picture. These patients are also characterized by, by um, abnormalities of the skeleton and connective tissue, such as osteoporosis, scoliosis, fractures, and hypermobility. They also can present then with vascular abnormalities. Hyper uh, IgE syndrome or drop syndrome, uh, it uh, it's characterized by immunologic characteristic and non-immunologic characteristic. And frequency of non-immunologic characteristic um, uh, is very high and presented ma mainly by allergic manifestation. And as we can see, eczema occurred in uh, all patients. And uh, serum uh, IgE more than 2,000 uh, presented in more than 90%. Uh, Eosinophilia is also very often. Besides this um, allergic manifestation, this Patients also present with boils and, with, as we uh, mentioned, recurrent pneumonias, mucocutaneous candidiasis, and increased incidence on lymphoma. Non immunological characteristics um, uh, are characteristic face, retained primary teeth, fractures, scoliosis, and causes syndrome. I would like to present our first case. This is male, nine years old, newborn period with omphalitis, at the age of one month sepsis with pneumonia, enterocolitis, omphalitis, pyodermia, at the age from six months to two years, uh, she, uh, he had three episodes of pneumonia. Since two years, recurrent cold abscesses every one two months and topic dermatitis since three months of age and at the age of six years uh, he had fractures. Uh, his IgE level was 8,000 and IgG and lymphocyte subpopulation was without significant uh, changes. And taking into account sepsis, recurrent pneumonia, recurrent cold abscesses, atopic dermatitis, fractures, high IgE level, hyper IgE syndrome was diagnosed. And at the age of uh, 16 years, uh, his IgE level was 59,000. And genetic testing revealed mutation in STAT3. Treatment option included antibiotics to treat infection, imatoprim, sulfamethoxazole, and ciprofloxacin, and topical medicine for skin rash, macrolimus. In uh, 2014, uh, autosomal recessive phosphoglucomutase 3 mutation was described in the literature and it was um, a link to immune deficiency, autoimmunity, and neurocognitive impairment. 
And as we can see, all these patients had allergic manifestation. Uh, this um, publication described two families and eight patients, and all these patients had severe allergic manifestation, allergic rhinitis, food, uh, food allergy, asthma, uh, and uh, atopic dermatitis. Uh, besides that, all they were presented with recurrent infections, pneumonia, otitis, staphylococcal skin uh, infection, Epstein-Barr virus uh, infection, uh, and uh, warts and other infections. Besides that, all these patients were presented with high IgE level, and it uh, counted in thousand from 5,000 to 27 and 35,000 um, uh, was uh, IgE level. Sorry. And besides uh, uh, immunological or uh, allergic manifestation, and besides uh, recurrent infections, these patients were presented with neurological manifestation, such as lab IQ, developmental delay, dysarthria, ataxia, hearing loss, central nervous system elimination <laughs> defect, abnormal EG, Stise and hypotonia. They were also presented with connective tissue disorders such as scoliosis, degenerative disc disease, dilated aortic root, microcephaly, esophageal strict, uh, and hematologic pathology such as Hodgkin lymphoma, hemolytic anemia, and neutropenia. Uh, uh, the recurrent respiratory tract infection in this patient leads to bronchiectasis and chronic respiratory failure. I would like to present our second case, male, 17 years old. Uh, it's presentation. Uh, he also presents with atopic dermatitis of age, asthma since two years. Uh, the, the features such as a flat or sunken appearance of the middle of the face, mid-face hypoplasia, micrognathia, full lips. The patient is presented with intellectual disability and dilated development. Uh, he has scissors and um, herpes virus uh, 6 and hypervirus 7. He uh, also presented with autoimmune thyroiditis and arthritis. Uh, he had a high level of antinuclear antibodies and his IgE level uh, it was uh, 14,000, uh, 14, uh, and also love uh, NK cells was seen. And taking it uh, uh, into account uh, his clinical picture and uh, uh, mutations that were revealed, GM3 deficiency was diagnosed. The next is Scott Aldrich syndrome, the Scott Aldrich syndrome is x link recessive um, disorders, and it's also uh, very well described in the literature. It characterized by a triad, and eczema is one of, of the signs of this triad, and it's okay in 80% of cases, and it can be mild to severe. The next uh, science is thrombocytopenia, and uh, with a small size of platelets, and thrombocytopenia leads to bleeding, bloody diarrhea, patechia, and bruising, and immune deficiency, as I said, 
times in these patients leads to recurrent bacterial infection, cytomegalovirus infection, hyper simple infection, and Epstein Barr virus infection. These patients also uh, characterized by uh, autoimmune disorders and they uh, have increased risk of cancer, especially lymphoma. Um, they are presented with a high level of IgA and IgE and 30% uh, presented with eosinophilia. The treatment option for this patient included hematopoietic stem cell transplantations and gene therapy. The next syndrome is DOC8 deficiency or formerly was known uh, as autosomal recessive hyper IgE syndrome and it belongs to combined immunodeficiency characterized by recurrent infections, allergies, and cancers. Recurrent infections in these uh, patients um, presented as respiratory drug infections that lead to bronchiectasis, skin infection presented as, as herpes simplex virus infection, human papilloma virus, and molluscum contagiosum, and often they are complicated by Staphylococcus aureus and Candida. Allergies in this patient uh, presented as eczema, food allergies, asthma, and other allergic symptoms. Uh, they can also um, uh, can, uh, can have skin cancer, lymphoma, a cancer of a lymphatic system. The laboratory uh, finding this patients included uh, high IgE levels, hypo IgM, and T cell lymphopenia and eosinophilia. And I would like to present also our set uh, case, boy, six year old. Uh, this is patient and uh, this is photo from the archive of Anna Hilfanova. And these patients were presented with severe eczema, uh, all, uh, all uh, body suffix was affected and eczema was with lichenification, excoriation, intensive eating, and eczema, severe eczema was presented from one month of age. Uh, as we can see, the patient um, uh, have uh, dysplastic ears, short, sick nose, rough features, and large tongue. Uh, he was also presented with perianal warts and onychomycosis. Two sets of teeth, uh, and uh, they were affected by carriers. And during first year of life, um, recurrent infection, uh, pneumonia, oral candida, stomatitis, otitis were seen. And from the age, from four to six year, uh, he twice was presented with sepsis, recurrent pneumonia, and polyarthritis. Osteoporosis fractures also occurred in this patient. Laboratory findings um, included hyper IgE11, 16,000, hyper IgA, and um, a low level of IgM. Uh, eosinophilia, 30%, and lymphopenia. Genetic testing revealed DOC8 homozygous mutation. Treatment options for these patients included antibiotics, antifungal um, treatment, uh, intravenous immunoglobulins, omalizumab uh, was uh, used with permanent effects, and um, only hematopoietic stem cell transplantation uh, uh, have a full effect and recovery. Uh, the next question, how we can to to distinguish hyper IgE primary immunodeficiency from atopia? How, how we can put 
gather this puzzle. That's on all uh, allergic manifestation in patients with primary immunodeficiency um, characterized by early onset of eczema. Then the combination with early onset with of infection. And infection may worsen with age and uh, lead to bronchiectasis and other complications. Then we should look for other signs of primary immunodeficiency, such as autoimmunity and malignancy. Besides that, um, allergic manifestations in patients with PID uh, very frequent um, uh, combined with non immunological features such as facial anomalies, skeletal abnormalities, neurological impairment, connective tissue disorders, and others. Uh, allergic manifestation in patients with PID is characterized by very high level of IgE. It counted in thousands. Besides that, laboratory findings such as lymphopenia, low IgA, IgM, and flu vaccine antibody responses may be also helpful in diagnosis. Some authors present with algorithm for primary care physicians. When we have eczema that combined with recurrent infections and elevated serum IgE, we should think about primary immunodeficiency. In the case of failure to thrive, severe food allergies and central nervous system findings, we should think about DOC8 immunodeficiency. In the case of skeletal abnormalities, um, pneumatocilis, we should think about STAT3, hyper IgE syndrome or JOP syndrome. And in the case of thrombocytopenia, especially in boys, we should think about the Scott Aldrin syndrome. Uh, hyper IgE scoring system may be also useful. And if we have suspicion, for hyper IgE syndrome, we should refer patients to a specialized center. You should also remember about a large number of, of uh, primary immunodeficiency that are associated with allergic like manifestations. And allergic like manifestations include urticaria, rash. And these symptoms is, is uh, characterized auto-inflammatory disorders, such as uh, some cryopyrin-associated uh, disorder, Maxwell Wells syndrome, familia called uh, syndrome, nomitosinca syndrome, and other syndromes, such as Traps, Blau syndrome, and um, a large number of other auto-inflammatory disorder. All these disorders are characterized by rash and fever. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, there is a group of complement deficiency and C1 inhibitor deficiency. And for this disorder or hereditary angioedema um, uh, is characterized is a, a characteristic angioedema, uh, but uh, creopine associated periodic syndrome and auto, uh, in patients with auto inflammatory disorders is characterized by deficit of cryopyrin that lead to leukocyte apoptosis, interleukin one processing. And rash in this patient uh, is caused by neutrophilic infiltrate in the dermis. In the case of C1 inhibitor deficiency, we have high production of bradykinin that leads to angioedema. But histamine and other muscle mediator, uh, as we see in patients with 
allergic manifestation are not directly involved in this patient. That's why antihistamine are not effective for these patients. The treatment approaches include general treatment strategies for primary immunodeficiency and treatments uh, for allergy symptoms. General treatment strategies for primary immunodeficiency consist of antibiotics, intravenous or subcutaneous immunoglobulins, for example, for Nizarton syndrome, hematopathic stem cell transplantation for some syndrome also, and gene therapy for viscot Aldrich syndrome, IPEC syndrome, open syndrome. Treatment of allergy syndromes include corticosteroids, topical or systemic, local application of calcineurin inhibitors, macrolimod or hemacrolimod. So primary immunodeficiency are often associated with viral, bacterial, and candida infections. It is a challenge to treat atopic dermatitis and other allergic manifestations by means of this drug, considering their immunosuppressive action. These medications are not recommended for long-term use or treatment of large surface areas. Skin and other infections should be carefully examined. In cases of skin superinfection with Staphylococcus aureus in patients with PID and eczema, systemic antibiotics and antiseptic arrangements are used. Long-term use of emollients for skin may be useful in some primary immunodeficiency, such as Nizarton syndrome, with Scott Aldrich syndrome. We also can use medication to control pruritus, and um, uh, there are some publications about uh, effective treatments of eczema uh, by uh, antibodies to immunoglobulin E omalizumab. Very important is a team approach. We should join in the skill of the immunologist, allergist with other specialists. The main take home messages, allergic manifestations are one of the clinical signs of primary immunodeficiency. Usually they present in the first year of life among the first symptoms of primary immunodeficiency and are commonly manifested by eczema and increased IgE. There is usually no correlation between IgE levels and severity of allergic skin manifestation. Often, the skin barrier function is not impaired in patients with eczema and primary immunodeficiency. Early differentiation of allergic manifestation due to ID from atopic dermatitis and other atopic condition is very difficult. But also, it is very important because it influences on the choice of treatment methods. And a multidisciplinary approach to the management of PID patients and prescription of appropriate treatment improve the prognosis and quality of life of PID patients. Thank you for your attention. Welcome to Ukraine. Welcome to Ternopil. Thanks uh, again, Professor Burchak. It was so informative, so spectacular and great uh, presentation. You learned a lot. And, uh, and our, to our dearest uh, audience, please uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat section. Uh, now it's time to ask Professor Adiriz Orange Baron to join us in uh, his uh, speech on molecular pediatrics in context of clinical pediatrics today and tomorrow. Professor Reinsberg, we are all with you. Dear colleagues and friends, I am very pleased and honored to participate in this prestigious International Congress of 
Pediatrics, which has been organized by the Tehran University of Medical Sciences. I would like to express my best thanks to chairman and uh, members of executive board for their kind uh, uh, invitation. I will try in the, in the next 30 minutes to present some aspects of the increasing role of uh, molecular pediatrics in uh, clinical pediatrics. Uh, Rudolf Virchow published the concept in which the origin of diseases should be found in error of cellular function. Paul Ehrlich expanded the approach of cellular and molecular levels. His perception of substances which react specifically with microorganisms of body's own cells uh, through of specific receptors introduced the beginning of molecular oriented therapy. The Max Dead Brooks work about the nature of gene mutation and gene structure was the base of modern molecular genetics and molecular biology. The development of modern cellular and molecular biology will lead in next years to paradigm change in diagnostic and therapy as well as in prevention of diseases. The use of molecular approach gives us the opportunity to explain the function of each cell and of particular cellular components and to understand the mechanisms and rules of their interactions in tissues and organs. By understanding of these biological processes, the possibility arises for rational and specific therapy as uh, opposed to up to now, mostly symptomatic approach. Uh, I would like uh, uh, to present some cases in the different uh, fields of pediatric. Uh, as an uh, example, asthma. The heterogeneity of asthma in relation to patients' characteristics, so called phenotype, underlying pathogenic mechanisms, so-called endotype, and clinically significant outcomes, including response to treatment has been established beyond any doubt. Uh, we know two types, uh, two endotypes of asthma. Firstly, the type two immune response in which we observe a predominance of cytokines such interleukin-4, interleukin-5, interleukin-13, and presence of eosinophils and Ig-mediated uh, allergy. Uh, secondly, the non-type 2 response uh, with predominance of neutrophils and uh, present of neutrophilic inflammation with uh, 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 cytokines uh, such interleukin-8, interleukin-23, interferon gamma, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. But there are another uh, endotypes uh, which have not been described previously. I would like to present one case. Um, A two-year-old uh, child came to our clinic with a massive um, uh, bronchial obstruction and pronounced wheezing. Uh, her, his mother has uh, inhaled the child uh, several times. The sabutamol, ipratropium gave him rectally prednisolone but without success. You can hear the wheezing without auscultation. Uh, 
um, we came to the examination room and the child has uh, uh, begun to cry. It is a cry of body and soul. During the cry, the breathing has uh, been disappeared. Uh, no visiting more after uh, the crying, but it was a cry of body and soul without medication. It is after 10 minutes, no visiting, sustained symptom free status. and it is after 30 minutes. We have studied the reason uh, of this phenomenon and um, we have found a problem at the level of neuropeptides. We have demonstrated and detected a decrease of uh, VIP of vasoactive intestinal peptide and uh, the increase of uh, substance P and norokinin A. With other words, um, it was a disbalance between the neuropeptides which act as bronchodilator and uh, the neuropeptides which act as bronchoconstructor. After crying, it was a simulation uh, and uh, um, we could um, observe the increase of um, uh, the VIP and uh, we think uh, on the base of this increase, the child has uh, uh, were symptom free. Uh, another case, a patient with treatment resistance chronic urticaria uh, for more than one year, um, all immunologic and allergic uh, examinations were without pathological uh, findings, all autoantibodies were negative and um, uh, the test for helicobacter pylori was negative. Um, uh, this patient has been treated uh, uh, with high dose antihistamines and uh, uh, local and systemic uh, corticosteroids, but without success. We have examined the Ig receptor and found uh, an increase of uh, Ig receptor compared to um, healthy control. We have treated this patient with uh, omalizumab and uh, uh, you can uh, see uh, the uh, this appearance of um, the urticaria after two weeks, only with one injections. Uh, we have uh, continued the therapy with uh, omalizumab over six months and uh, we could um, detect a sustained uh, reduction of Ig receptors um, parallel to clinical improvement. It is another case, it's a, uh, it's a patient with recurrent treatment resistance nasal polyps the patient underwent several times 
um, surgical measures, but without access. And uh, we have found uh, high IG receptors in nasal polyps tissues, and we have treated this patient uh, with omalizumab, and it is the result after uh, two months. Uh, uh, there are uh, several uh, polypoid uh, changes and an abstraction of osteomyotal complex. It is after therapy and uh, you see an improvement in all uh, area. Um, parallel to clinical and uh, radiologic improvement, um, we have observed done regulation of IG receptors on basophils. Another aspect, and it's a clinical application of molecular medicine in neurologic disorders in pediatrics. The GNAO1 associated infantile epileptic encephalopathy is a rare disease with mutations in the guanine nucleotide binding protein, alpha activating activity polypeptide O. It is characterized by early onset epileptic encephalopathy, severe involuntary uh, movements and tractable seizures, severe motor developmental delay, and severe intellectual disability. Patients with GNAO1 mutations can present a severe progressive hyperkinetic movement disorder with prolonged life threatening exacerbations, which uh, are refractory to most anti-dystonic and anti-convulsive medications and can lead to multi-organ failure and even to death. It is a, this is a patient um, with this mutation. The patient has been treated with uh, curant, with alicurant on off-label anticonvulsive uh, uh, medications, but without success. It's the same patient. It is after clonazepam, diazepam, and chloral dehydrate. But we could not control the uh, movement disorders. Um, just, I would like uh, to present uh, uh, another uh, patient with this, with the same mutation. Um, and uh, this um, patient is now uh, 15 years old. I have diagnosed uh, the mutation at the six of, at the age of uh, six years and um, because of the very difficult condition um, of this child, uh, we have um, performed an innovative for the first Alec. in collaboration to, uh, with Stop. our neurosurgeon, Stop that I use. neurosurgeon in Cologne. And deep brain simulation of the globus pallidus internus acts uh, the true multifactorial mechanisms, including uh, immediate neuromodulatory effects, synaptic uh, plasticity, and long term neuronal reorganization. And uh, 
this is the patient after deep, uh, deep brain stimulation, no seizure, no um, movement disorders, no medications, and a significant improvement of motoric uh, ability. Next case. This is a patient um, with a typical rape syndrome um, uh, with a uh, pronounced um, uh, convulsion and it was refractory to therapy with um, muscle hypotonia, the psychosomatic retardation, and the It was a It was the condition of this child. No chewing uh, ability. We have treated uh, this patient on the base of um, uh, molecular medicine, mole molecular pediatrics, and uh, this is the result. You have uh, uh, seen and uh, improvement in all levels, uh, cognition, uh, muscle force, and uh, motoric. Oh. And, this, and this child was able to walk after therapy. Dear colleagues and friends, I hope I could demonstrate some uh, eminent uh, uh, role of uh, molecular pediatrics in um, context of clinical pediatrics. Thank you very much for your attention. Professor uh, Iris Orangebar, uh, thank you very much for your uh, educational, spectacular uh, presentation. And uh, we learned a lot from your experiences and your lecture. Um, the, uh, the audiences uh, did not have any question uh, to ask you. I wanted to uh, um, thank you again. Uh, from each and every one of us uh, here at Children's Medical Center, uh, Tehran University of Medical Sciences, we would like to say a particular thank you uh, to Professor Rezai, Professor Ranchbar, Professor Burchek, and Professor Mahdevinya, uh, whose support we are honored to have. And despite the time difference, we are more than happy to get involved. A special thank you also goes to all fantastic audiences. 
if you want to receive this, and again, uh, it is uh, worth mentioning that if you want to receive a certificate of attendance in this Congress, make sure to register on our website and reserve a seat on your desired panel. For our Iranian audience, if you want to receive a CME credit, don't forget to participate in the panel quiz in maximum of two days uh, in the cmequiz.ir. Don't forget to follow us on, uh, on our social media pages and our YouTube channel to stay updated on our next events. Uh, as I informed, um, there are some uh, questions. Uh, I would, uh, it would be appreciated if uh, Professor Ranger answered that. Uh, how did you treat Rett syndrome? Professor Ranger, if you're online, um, it would be appreciated to answer this question. Dear Professor. Uh, as it seems, Professor Ranchbar, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, we are calling him. Uh, it would be appreciated if you just uh, be a little patient. It, it seems that some technical problem has occurred. Dr. Ari Mugadam is calling him by phone and asking your question uh, by him by phone. Uh, it seems that uh, there, is, there are some problems uh, with his internet and uh, we are asking him and answer you um, here. And if we, are, we are broadcasting his voice by, by here, it is possible. Dr. Ari Mugadam, we discuss your question. Uh, Dr. Um, Ari Mugadam, uh, Sorry, uh, uh, I just talked to Professor Ranjbar and uh, there was a technical problem that he cannot be with us uh, with the, uh, up to the end of the session. And uh, I just asked him uh, about the treatment of the patient with the Rett syndrome and he just told me that it will be published soon and uh, you can enjoy the publication. So uh, thank you all, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for participating in this session, and I hope uh, you have enjoyed the session. Azim. Thank you, Dr. Ari Mugadam, for your great uh, answer uh, to us. Again, if you want to receive a certificate of attendance uh, in this Congress, make sure to register on our website and reserve a seat on your desired panel. For our Iranian audience, if you want to receive the CME credit, don't forget to participate in the panel quiz in maximum of two days on cmequiz.ir. Don't forget to follow us on social media pages and YouTube channel to stay updated on, on our next events. And uh, unless there are any other questions, I want to thank you everyone who has participated on today's call. Um, thank you for uh, your uh, patience. We look forward to seeing you at this meeting and you're uh, sure you will find it out an outstanding educational opportunity. Again, thank you everyone for your patience. We appreciate your continued cooperation with us. Please submit your questions to us on our social media. And uh, if we, you have anything as that uh, you thought of after conclude uh, today's session, we will make sure to answer those questions. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice time. Take care of yourself. Good afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>